All right, good morning. Welcome. We're going to get started now. Thank you all for coming. My name is Anthony Cody, and I'm uh, one of the board members and uh, the founder, co-founder of the Network for Public Education, um, which was founded just four years ago and is led by Diane Ravitch. Uh, I myself worked in the Oakland schools for 24 years and now live in Mendocino County. Um, NPE has emerged as the leading national advocacy organization working to defend public education and public schools from the onslaught of privatization that has been underway over the last decade. Um, we've heard countless times that charter schools are public schools. There's a handout in part of your packet that you might have picked up at the, at the desk there that's part of a series of short informational briefs that the Network for Public Education recently put out uh, and are available at our website. And they point out exactly why charter schools are not public schools. While charters get public funding, they're not subject to any sort of democratic control and many operate behind closed doors, resulting in scandal after scandal. It's time for that to change. The Network for Public Education's Executive Director, Carol Burris, recently wrote a series of reports looking particularly at California's Wild West of charter schools. She found charter learning centers operating out of strip malls which requires students to show up as, as little as once every 20 days. She found graduation rates below 10% in some cases. She found tangled webs of authorizers and executives getting paid small fortunes to oversee these pseudo schools. In concluding her series of articles, investigative series, she wrote, if California is to maintain a healthy and sustainable public school system, there are big questions that must be answered. How much choice is enough? How many schools are sustainable given a, given a population of students? What happens when choice exacerbates segregation? Who ensures that the separation of church and state is enforced? Is it good for the emotional and social growth of adolescents to be unsupervised all day, receiving instruction on a computer rather than with their peers? Under such circumstances, who ensures that the child is emotionally healthy and safe? For whom are learning centers appropriate? Should for-profit corporations hundreds or thousands of miles away be in charge? What level of of responsibility should an authorizing agency assume when it opens and receives funding for supervising a charter school. The research and bills that you hear about today will begin to address those questions. You know, I said thank you for being here is partly because this is a subject that is so technical that it makes everybody's eyes glaze over. Like if you say, oh, I'd like to talk to you about charter school facility financing, it's like before you finish the sentence, People can't, already can't stand the conversation, and yet it's, it's unbelievably important, and there's a huge amount of money involved. Thank you for being among the people who are paying attention. In California, there's over $2.5 billion that have gone to pay for the construction, purchase, rent, or lease of buildings for charter schools. And this is, <clears throat> this is mostly in the past decade. And, you know, like many things, you can't get uh, comprehensive numbers for everything. So if you read the report, not, this is not 100% of the money that has been spent. But over $2.5 billion, either in direct taxpayer dollars or tax-subsidized financing. The first two of the numbers up here, the Charter School Facility Grant Program, um, which is almost $400 million, that is just taxpayer dollars, straight cash delivered to charter schools to pay for their rent lease or, or mortgage payments. Uh, general obligation bonds are also straight out of the taxpayer's pockets. And the rest of this, both state and federal funding, is taxpayer subsidized. But so it's $2.5 billion. One of the, there are multiple different vehicles that pay for different parts of facilities funding. One of the most important is the first on this list, the uh, Charter Facility Grant Program, which is sometimes called SB 740 because that was the name of the Senate bill that authorized this money. Under this bill, 
up to any charter school can get up to $750 per student per year or up to 75% of their total rent or lease costs or mortgage costs reimbursed by state taxpayers. It doesn't matter if they're in a, you know, whose building they're in, um, whether it's rent or purchase or construction costs, up to 75% of those is just straight cash that goes to every charter school, uh, almost every charter school in the state. So for $2.5 billion, which is a ton of money, what did we get? The, the really shocking thing <clears throat> that struck me when I first started to look at this is that although the state has all kinds of goals for what are charter schools supposed to be accomplishing, none of those goals are written into the rules about how you get money. So the money goes out essentially with no targeting and no criteria whatsoever. The first question that anybody would ask in, a, in planning about building schools or opening new schools is, oh, how many kids are there and how many schools do we need for the number of kids there are? If you were running a public school district and you said, well, we already have enough classroom space for all the kids we have, and somebody came along and said, hey, how about if we spend $10 million and build a new school, you would never do it because you have enough space. In the public system, when a school district wants to build a new public school, it's, it's usually built with state bonds. And in order to get state bond money, the State Department of Education does a calculation which they say, how many, what's your projected student population over the next five or 10 years, and how much classroom space do you need, and do you actually need another school? If you don't need another school based on that, you don't have access to state bond money and usually can't open a, a public school. Charter schools uh, are not subject to that check. So there are four, nearly 450 charter schools have opened in California in places where, according to the state's own calculation, there already was enough classroom space for every child in that community. So, and, and those schools, um, our estimate is the total amount of money that went to schools like that is almost $500 million in straight tax dollars and another $700 million in tax subsidized spending. Went to schools that opened in places where there was no need for additional classroom space. Now, understandably, you might think, well, the rationale for opening charter schools is not just because you don't have enough space, it's because they offer something that's new, different, or better than what's otherwise available in local schools. And that is the idea of charter schools, but that also is not written any place into either the criteria for authorizing a school or for giving out this money. You know, one of the most intuitive questions you would ask about funding for opening new charter schools is, did the school perform better than nearby public schools that serve similar students, right? You don't want to compare schools for rich kids with schools for poor kids, but among schools serving similar students, did it perform better? And there are many, many, many problems with using test scores for a, the measure of educational quality, and I think it's the wrong measure, but it's the measure that the state has at its disposal. And if we look at test scores, what this shows is we did an analysis that says for all the charter schools that open in California, how many opened in a place where they performed better on test scores than nearby public schools that served a demographically similar student population? Three quarters fail that test. In other words, three quarters of charter schools open in a place where there is a nearby traditional public school that serves the demographically similar population of students and the public school performs better than the charter. So you know, I think if we're looking at saying we want to open a charter school in a place where there already are, there's no need for additional classroom space, it should have to be exceptional in some way. Either it offers, you know, this is a school that offers Chinese immersion program and no other school in the community offers it. Or we have a way of teaching that somehow gets dramatically better uh, performance by the students. None of those criteria are included in funding. So there's been hundreds of millions of dollars wasted every year on schools built in places where they're both not needed for more classroom space and they don't provide anything that is new, different, or better than what is already available to students and parents um, in the local community. In your packets, you, you, there's, a, there's just a list of samples of examples of schools you know, from places all over the state. This is not limited to any particular community in the state of schools that have um, that opened in places where the public schools were better. This problem of like just, you know, what looks to me is like inadvertently, not from bad faith, but in effect it's like the state opened a spigot of funding and walked away. And it just goes out to schools as long as they're legally compliant and financially stable, um, they qualify for these funds. The reason that there's no targeting happens in two steps. The first step is the problem with the authorization, which is 
local, local school districts are prohibited by law from taking into account certain things that are very common sense when deciding whether a new charter school should be authorized. So they cannot, they're prohibited from um, taking into account for are there already too many schools for the number of students? Are there too many of this type of school that a company wants to open? Does the school just replicate teaching methods that are already in wide use? Or is there any evidence that the company will provide a level of education that's better than what's already available? You're if you're on a school board, you're prohibited from thinking about those things as a basis for deciding whether to authorize a charter school. When schools, if schools are rejected by their local elected school board, they can appeal, as Donald said, to the county or state. And normally we think, oh, it's harder to win things on appeal. In this case, it works in the opposite way. It is harder for charter applications to be rejected at the higher level. So by the time you get to the state, there are only two reasons that the State Board of Education can reject a charter application, which is that it's likely to pose physical education or psychological harm to students, or that it's not likely to be of educational benefit, right? Which means not that it's not better than other things, it means you would have to say either it's gonna harm kids or it will be of no benefit to them, like as, the same as if they stayed home without homeschooling. So that's obviously an extremely low bar that it's, it's very, very difficult for charter schools not to be authorized. Instead of being choosy, we're almost legally prohibited from, from exercising common sense on this. And then once authorized, um, schools have access to these hundreds of millions of dollars of money that flow regardless of their specialization and regardless of their quality of education. So there are costs, you know, there are mil hundreds of millions of dollars that are just have been wasted but in addition to those direct costs, there are also critical costs that this imposes on public schools and public school districts. Because when you build a school, especially in a place that already has enough schools for all the kids, the only way to do it, the only way to fill it, is by drawing students away from existing public schools. And that imposes costs because the school district loses a, you know, a prorated share of the funding, per pupil funding, for each student who doesn't go, but they can't reduce costs by the same amount because there are a whole lot of costs in schools and in a school district that are really fixed costs, at least, you know, not over, over the long term, you can close buildings, but over 10 or 20 years are fixed costs. And to give you an idea of that, if, you, if a charter school opens and it pulls 5% of students from a bunch of nearby public schools, if 5% of students are taken away and they're evenly distributed, the school may not even be able to, to lay off a single teacher. If you, even 10%, if there's 32 kids in a class and 10% are gone, so now there's 29 kids in a class, you still need a class, you still need a teacher. Even if some teachers are reduced, the building costs, I mean, this is a list of things that are fixed. Building costs, heating, cooling, maintenance, custodial staff, the lunchroom equipment and staff, the, the core administrators, principal, vice principal, uh, administrative staff, guidance counselor, the, if it's in a district where the district provides uh, school transportation, bus service, all that is the same. Many, many central costs, who, who oversees the federal grants, who certifies kids as being eligible for free or reduced lunches. All of those things have to go on, but you have 5% or 10% less revenue which creates a crisis in the district and a crisis in schools that are under pressure to take money out of classroom instruction into those central costs that can't be reduced. So there are very real costs and money directly thrown away, but there are also a secondary set of costs imposed on schools and school districts by doing this. And again, if you think about, uh, if you were a district and said, I don't know, we have 50 schools and we have 10,000 kids and now we wanna have the same number of kids, but an extra 20 schools, you increase the total amount of the school budget that goes to buildings, that goes to heating and cooling, that goes to student transportation, that goes to a lot of things other than student instruction just by the fact that you decided we're gonna have more schools and we're gonna pay for those school buildings out of the same pot of money even though they don't provide anything new and the education may be mediocre. One is that you know, part, part of the original idea of creating charter schools was that they were supposed to be like, they were called, um, an R&D sector where there would be a lot of startups and innovation and trying different things. And if to the extent that that's the goal, then funding for charter startups should be aimed at like small mom and pop schools where there's a group of parents or a group of educators or a community organization that wants to do something innovative for their set of kids. What we see instead is that the vast majority of this two and a half billion dollars is being captured by the big 
corporate chains of, you know, that are, are up to 30, 40 schools in a chain. So if you look at a CMO's uh, charter management organization, chains of three schools or more, they're less than 30% of the schools, but they get more than 60% of the funding. And the, the report breaks it down. In some cases, it's like 80% of certain sources of funding because they're big corporations that have central staff that are more sophisticated at applying for money and getting money. It's not really a surprise, but it runs counter to what the policy idea of charter schools was supposed to be. That first uh, type of funding that I explained that un under SB 740, which is just cash for up to 75% of a school's costs, there's a particularly damaging thing here, which is in the regulations for this, it says that the money can only be used for rent or lease, but not for purchase of property. But the big corporate chains have found a way to get around that, have used a, a legal technicality, so that what we now have is your tax dollars being used to buy private property for corporate chains of charter schools. And what they've done very briefly is you have the, the charter organization that then sets up a separate corporation, a limited liability corporation that owns the property, that they, there it's a wholly owned subsidiary, and over here is the wholly owned subsidiary that's the school. And they say, well, the school is renting from the LLC which owns the property. And then the LLC is taking the exact amount of rent and using it to pay the mortgage. So it's just this little legal trickery. It's not illegal, but it subverts the intent of the law. And the result is that we have public money being used to buy private property. In the biggest case, this is a picture of a school in Los Angeles that is valued at $9 million that was paid for with $2.5 million in cash from this SB 740 program and $8.5 million in tax subsidized conduit bonds. It's private property. Now, so one of the, and this is the Alliance Chain of Schools. The Alliance Chain of Schools now has a private real estate. I don't know if what counts as an empire in California, but it's worth over $200 million. They have a chain of privately owned real estate worth over $200 million that has been largely paid for by the public. Now, in addition to, I think, the scandal of using public money to buy private property, this also, you know, for the, the people who are promoting school choice, this is the opposite of choice. Because every time there's a, privately, a, a publicly paid school that is private property, it means that elected officials or parents or community members don't have a choice to say, you know what, it turns out the school doesn't meet our needs, or it turns out the education is subpar. We want to replace this with another school. If you go to the school, if this school becomes low performing and parents or community or elected officials in Los Angeles say, this, the education here is crappy, it's, you're not doing right by our kids, we want a different school here, the answer is going to be, well, you know, knock yourselves out, go spend another $10 million to build a school someplace else because you can't take our building and you can't put a different school into our building. So we end up in a situation where the public, in theory, has the choice to say if a school goes bad, we're going to replace it with a different school. But in reality, if every time you do that you need to build a new school, it, the choice is, is, um, is not a real choice. And as these private real estate networks get bigger and bigger, we're in danger of creating privately run, publicly funded, privately run school systems that are too big to fail, where no matter how bad the education is, you can't afford to close it because you can't afford to build the replacement school. And Alliance and some of these schools, if we say, well, we're going to cancel your charter, they could turn the property into condos, into retail space, sell it to private developers, whatever they want to do, even though tax dollars paid for it. Last year, the American Civil Liberties Union did a survey of California charter schools and found that 20% of charter schools maintained explicit written policies that were illegal because they discriminated against different types of kids. The types of discrimination that they did, charter schools by law are required to accept any student who applies as long as they have space. What they found instead is schools that, that um, prohibit kids from coming who have low grades or low test scores, expel kids with low grades, prohibit kids from coming who have poor English, require citizenship identification from parents, or make enrollment conditional on parent, parental financial contributions to the school. All of this is illegal. All of this artificially creates high test scores because they're trying to keep out kids who would score low. And all of this was done with public funding. The 253 schools that the ACLU identified as having illegally discriminatory policies received $75 million in taxpayer cash under the SB 740 program, $120 million in general obligation bonds, and $150 million in conduit bond funding. That money is continuing now to go to some of those schools, like net today while we stand here, even though this report came out last summer. And none of those schools had their money taken back. 
Now, as far as I know, in most areas of the law, if you defraud the state and get public money fraudulently and you're found out to have done it, you have to give the money back. But there is no, as far as I know, there is no mechanism even under the um, California School Finance Authority, which is the, uh, the, the part of the government under the state treasurer that administers this program, there's no mechanism to claim that money back. And so taxpayers have been subsidizing illegal discriminatory practices in 20% of charter schools, and they get to keep the money. The California Charter School Association released a statement saying, this report is biased because uh, the teachers' union likes it, and so you know it's biased, or something like that. And I want to talk about this a little. I mean, first, because it is personally offensive to me. I don't know if this should matter, but so you know. I'm a professor at the University of Oregon. I'm not an advocate. I did not get paid a penny to do this work. I have no personal financial interest in what happens with education policy in California. If you're an advocate, and there can be good advocates, obviously, but if you work for CCSA and the facts convince you that charter schools are not a good idea, and you say that, you'll lose your job because you need to voice a certain opinion. If you're a tenured professor, there's only one thing you can lose your job over, and that's what they accuse me of in this report, which is being biased. The thing that our pay and promotion and tenure is based, is based on is one thing, which is doing social science in a rigorous and impartial way. If I did something that slanted data, that really I could lose my job over. What opinion I give, what conclusion I draw from the facts, <coughs> That's what, you, that's what you are protected by, by being a professor. So I find it personally offensive, but I also think, you know, it's not offending me, though, so that's not so important, but um, the, they said, oh, it's biased. Now, this is not, I don't think this is an anti-charter school report. There are good and bad charter schools like there's good and bad public schools. This is a report that is calling for standards of quality where now there are none. And as an example of that, the Charter School uh, Association puts out their own ranking of schools, they, in the, in the last ranking that they put out, identified 161 charter schools in California that they ranked among the worst of the worst, which is to say they were in the bottom 10% of similar schools, of schools that served similar populations. Those schools got $45 million in SB 740 money, $57 million in general obligation bonds, and $125 million in tax-subsidized financing. I assume they don't think their own numbers are biased. Right? The heart of this report is to say we're wasting hundreds of millions of dollars now because there is no criteria whatsoever for what school can open and what school can access public funding. You could argue about what the, exactly where you should draw the line. If I say, well, to open a school in a place that already has enough schools, you sh your test scores should be at least 50% higher than anything else. Maybe 50% is wrong. Maybe 25% is right. I think reasonable people could differ about exactly where the criteria should be. But if somebody comes and says there should be no criteria, no matter how crappy a school is, no matter how badly it's serving kids, as long as it's legally compliant and financially solvent, tax dollars should continue to flow into that school. To me, that is a crime against kids. And that is not being serious about a policy discussion. So if CCSA wants to come and say, hey, we have an idea of where we think the line should be drawn, and it's different from where Professor Lafer says or somebody else, that's a good argument. Like, that's a reasonable argument to say. If you're, if you're in a position where somebody is saying, my position is there should be no standards whatsoever, that to me is abandoning obligation to children. When we talk about wasted money, and hundreds of millions of dollars is obviously dramatic, but when we look at what is not being funded in the school system now, and probably everybody in this room has their own ideas of that from your experience in the education system or just your experience as parents, but to share with you some of the things that were shared with me um, from, mem from school board members or superintendents, um, in Oakland, uh, there is now one guidance counselor for every 500 students, which means only seniors in high school ever get to talk to a guidance counselor. Middle, middle school students, uh, freshmen, sophomore, juniors in high school do not. Um, in Carlsbad, a board member told me about a great music program that they have in elementary school that is in danger of being shut down because <clears throat> they can't afford to hire credentialed music teachers. Superintendent of the Anaheim District talked about terrible needs that are going unmet, unmet for special needs students, for English learners, and that they need social workers, especially for kids who come from communities where there's the highest poverty, homelessness, people going in and out of juvenile detention system, and they don't have social workers to help those kids stabilize their lives and be able to have a, a better shot at succeeding in school. All of these things are part of the ways that we're paying for the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent on schools that don't give us anything that is anything that is 
useful for students that's not already there. It's not like we live in a world of unlimited money where you could say, yeah, so we wasted 200 million bucks, but I got 200 million more over here. There are terrible things that are not being funded every day in the school system that makes it so urgent to get this right. So the last thing I want to say is um, if you look at the original intention of creating charter schools in California, and this is a quote from Senator Gary Hart, not that Gary Hart, but California's Gary Hart, who is the author of the charter school legislation here. You know, <clears throat> this is what he was talking about. It's almost heartbreaking to look at what their vision was compared to what we got. He put something out in 1992 to explain to legislative colleagues, what is this weird thing, charter schools, that I'm talking about? Like, what, what should we be imagining? He said, here's three examples of things that you could imagine. One is a school where teachers follow the student. He says, quote, teachers at a small district offering K-8 instruction could request a charter to establish a program which allows teachers to teach the same group of students throughout their elementary and middle school years, allowing teachers to develop a deep understanding of the abilities and learning needs of each pupil. Or an ungraded primary school. Teachers in grades K to 3 could request a charter to operate a program which eliminates the traditional grade level structure to provide developmentally appropriate curriculum. Or he envisions a school for at-risk pupils. An urban middle school whose pupil population consistently scores below average could form a collaborative with a university and seek a charter to provide a special accelerated program to provide concentrated assistance. The program would include a challenging curriculum instead of repetitive remediation and intensive instructional strategies with a charter located on a university campus. Like, all these things are great, but this is not what we got. And, I, you know, I um, kind of said in the report, when you look at it, it looks to me like instead of innovation, what we got is repetition, big chains just doing the same model over and over and over again. Instead of local startups, we have corporate control. Instead of empowered teachers, we have executive rule. And instead of excellence, we have mediocrity. So it's, I, I have a 10-year-old uh, girl in fifth grade in Eugene with, with 35 kids in her class and a lot of whatever. Things, same things to other people. But so I would say as a parent, even more than as a professor or analyst, like, it's heartbreaking to think about what was envisioned and what things are now. But it's not too late to turn it around. There's $500 million in new money for constructing charter schools that was authorized in last, uh, last fall's election that is waiting to go out. The California School Finance Authority has uh, uh, a lot of uh, leeway over how this money goes out, and obviously there's legislation that is being proposed for this session that would have an important effect on changing this to a better direction. So uh, I'm from Oregon, but it's up to all of you to take the urgency of this problem and, and move it in a better direction because there's still time to fix it. My name is Tia Nguyen. Um, I'm here with public advocates today, um, and I'm also here to facilitate the question and answer session. Um, but, but before that, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we can email the slides to everyone, so um, don't worry about the technical difficulties with not being able to see the pictures. Um, but uh, we have five minutes for a question and answer session, so if anyone has any questions for um, Mr. Cohen or Dr. Lafer, um, we can go ahead and answer those now. Please. Uh, did you study California only, or do you have other data uh, across uh, So far, just California. But um, California is the biggest, you know, the charter industry is the biggest here, and this is also a place where a lot of the big chains kind of grow up and then expand to the rest of the country. About a year or so, commissioned a, a white paper by the National Education Policy Center based in Colorado that, did, that looked across the country at these issues. It didn't do a deep dive. This was a second step for us is to do a deep dive into a state, and we may look at other states to do. But we have found similar, not the necessarily the legislative or the statutory uh, similarities, but the similar issues uh, in Florida, I mean, across the country. Can you make specific recommendations in your research for California policy changes? I did make, uh, I made kind of possible recommendations. I, I, the point of the report was more to document the problem. Um, but yes, there is a, a recommendation section towards the end of the report. And I, th I think they're fairly common sense. Uh, some is to um, restore authorization authority to the local level, to elected officials and local school boards, and to enable them to take into account all the kinds of things that you'd want to take into account. Some is to not build, not build new schools in places that already have enough, um, enough schools for all the kids who need them, unless there's something really extraordinary about the new school. There are... Um, 
some is to not allow public money to be used to buy private property and eliminate future choice for parents and policymakers. There is what I didn't talk about, but is also in the report, is several cases of corruption. And you know, I think any time you have an industry that is, where there's a low bar to entry and there's government money flowing through, it's going to attract people who are interested in enriching themselves at the public expense. That's not the biggest problem, and that's not the. I, I don't want to characterize the charter industry as if that's what is most of what's going on. But it's a serious problem, and it's something that should be able to be solved legislatively. Um, so those are among the recommendations, and, and there is a section on recommendations if people want to look at that. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, I will reintroduce myself. My name is Tia Nguyen. Um, I am the Policy and Administrative Coordinator at Public Advocates. We are a nonprofit civil rights legal organization, and I work on the education equity team, and we work on a variety of educational issues, such as school accountability, um, teacher quality and shortage, opportunities for learning, and um, of most relevance today, charter schools. Um, so we are proud to co-sponsor this year AB 1360, um, Assembly Member Bonta's bill, um, to ensure fair admission and fair discipline policies um, for charter schools. Um, so that all students can have equal access to education. Um, we are co-sponsoring with the California Teachers Association, ACLU, Public Council, um, Alliance of Boys and Men of Color, and um, California Federation of Teachers. Um, as mentioned earlier, last August, Public Advocates, in partnership with the ACLU of Southern California, um, we published a report called Unequal Access, How Some California Charter Schools Illegally Restrict Enrollment. Um, in that report, we identified that over 250 charter schools in California um, were using unlawful admissions requirements that were discriminatory, including um, requiring document, or I'm sorry, un immigration related documents, um, a specific level of English proficiency, a specific level of academic performance, and also even um, a specific number of parental volunteer hours. And if they were unable to do that, um, a specific um, amount of dollars that they can pay. Um, what this report found was that exclusionary policies are being implemented by charter schools, and this problem is endemic across the state. These admissions criteria, along with disciplinary procedures that are not transparent and not following um, due process, are extremely harmful. Um, this is harmful to our promise of equitable access to opportunities for learning, especially for our most vulnerable student populations. Um, such as English learners, low-income students, students of color, and undocumented students. Um, so by co-sponsoring, we are proud um, to support fair admissions policies and fair discipline policies um, for charter schools and um, equal access to opportunities to education um, for charter schools across the state. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here inadvertently because California NAACP sponsored a resolution calling for a moratorium on charter schools for accountability and transparency. But you need to know that, the, and it came from California, and our process is that it goes through the National Convention, and if we're able to, if we can get it on the floor of the convention, there are many things we can't get on the floor because of, we got our politics too. But if it gets on the floor of the convention uh, and it passes, then it has to go to the board of directors for um, them to bless and implement. In this case, it sort of got out in the media that we had passed this resolution. And before we could get to our board of directors meeting, all hell had broken loose because the Charter School Association decided to target the NAACP. And we just had a whole bunch of consternation at our board meeting where this resolution was going to be uh, finally approved with people storming our meetings saying, NAACP, you don't represent me. Flashback. I worked for CTA for 13 years, and when Gary Hart was doing this legislation, CTA was one of the last ones to come aboard because we believed the nose under the tent was the beginning of a big problem. Uh, yes, we have problems in public education, but you don't fix it by destroying public education. You fix it by strengthening public education. But there was a lot of pressure because at that time, CTA looked like it had its head in the sand, wasn't going to agree to anything innovative, and Gary Hart was the new kid on the block, the new senator, and uh, he was sponsoring this legislation. Flashback a little bit before then, uh, we had beat back vouchers. Uh, about 1974, somewhere along there, they tried a voucher initiative, 
and uh, luckily CTA had a lot of resources and other a few others, and we beat back the voucher. But what was what was reminiscent of the voucher program was reminiscing in the charter school program is that they were targeting after they couldn't get the vouchers, then they started getting African Americans because that's where the lowest performing schools were at that time. Latinos were not as much on the map as African Americans, so they <clears throat> started getting our community to speak out. They wanted vouchers. I went to Milwaukee. No, I went to Alaska, and I debated Polly Williams who wanted vouchers for Milwaukee. And um, the, uh, it was for the Legislative Black Caucus, and none of them had the nerve to debate her, and they set me up. And when I got there, this woman was like a grandmother. I'm the grandmother now, but she was the grandmother then. And she was, I'm just trying to save my children. And, of course, I look like the big heavy from the California Teachers Association that come to beat up on this little grandmother. And, of course, she won the debate. And I got a plaque for going, but I also got uh, really educated on how they were targeting our community to get these programs through. I disagree, Professor. There was no good intent in this. It was to break down the big pot of money that went into education and privatize it. And uh, everybody else was used along the way, as we have found is still going on in this listening tour. Not one of these big conglomerates came out. We passed a resolution. We created a, the uh, chair created a task force so that we could go on a listening tour, so we could find out if what's really going on in education, as though people didn't know. And so we started in Connecticut and went from Connecticut to uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, to Florida, to Detroit. Uh, to California, to New Orleans, and I want to tell you, and we're going to New York at the end of this month, you, there is no continuity. Uh, every place has a different kind of approach with their strategies. Now, if you're the NACP and you were the authors and the sponsors of Brown v. Board in 1954 and you wanted equality education and you want to make sure that little black kids and little brown kids got the same and little poor white kids got the same education as those in suburbia who live uh, in those rich communities, you did not envision anything called choice that was going to take the bottom out of that um, law. So we won the lawsuit. We got Brown v. Board, and then we came in. I came in. I was in CTA, and so there was all this machinations. They killed that v, uh, Brown v. Board with busing and with all kinds of things that had nothing to do with quality education in the neighborhood, in the local schools. It had everything to do with all kind of other politics. Uh, you know, like we had to take our kids all the way across country to sit with white kids so they could perform. That's ludicrous. You just build up quality where quality is needed, and you hope that all kids will benefit from it. So from Brown v. Board to now, we have the opposite of what we started out to get. I don't know uh, uh, quite what the solution is. We hear all kinds of solutions. But uh, the heartbreaker was to go to Detroit, where Miss Betsy came from, and to see what Miss Betsy has done to the Detroit school system. Uh, it's a low-performing charter school system, practically. But the biggest heartbreak was in New Orleans. I was there just a couple weeks ago. And what's going on in New Orleans is absolutely unconscionable. They have taken advantage of Katrina, and they have practically wiped out the public school system as we know it. They have imposed charter schools on all of the kids there, and they now have four schools left, and I understand those will be chartered by the time we get to go back to do something about it at our convention. And these kids, they were confused. They thought we were the enemy because Oh, oh, by the way, after we passed this charter school resolution and we were going to about to start to have our hearings, then the election was held. And so we expanded from charter schools to quality public education. So we were trying to have a balanced look out here because the charter schools accused us of being biased and that we, that we got poor performing public schools. Well, we do. <clears throat> but we've almost killed the, the public schools by criticizing them in a group, we never say they're good public schools and they're poor public schools. We just say, oh, public education is bad. Let's get rid of public education. 
And so we advocates have had as much fault at uh, opening the door for these exploiters to take over charter schools and do with them what they've done. There's been no experimentation. I was going to tell you about New Orleans, but it makes me cry when I see all these kids who came out who thought we were the enemy, who, who stormed our hearing. And we had presentations because, as I said, we're trying to have balance. So we have a charter school presenter and we have a, a traditional educator presenter. And we had a couple of times we've had CF, uh, CFA or we've had NEA. Uh, we've had some good balance. But these kids thought because they heard the charter school that we were there advocating charter schools. And they stormed the microphone. And if you could hear the horror stories. They had a picture of some kids sitting in cubicles cu- uh, the size of this square with their face against the wall being punished for eight hours or six hours a day. They had kids who stand up and say, I took, uh, I took Spanish for two years, and then the third year they gave me French, and I go, no, I need Spanish. And they go, oh, no, you got to take French. Another one stood up and said, we didn't have a teacher for a week. And, I mean, they were angry. They were painting. And they thought we were the enemy. We almost lost control of the hearing by trying to explain to them that we were out on a listening tour. And then after they, we finally got them to kind of understand what we were doing, then they said, well, you got to come to our school tomorrow. What are you going to do? They won't let my mom come to the school. My mom can only go to school at a certain time. It is horrible at the amount of diversity and lack of accountability across this country. But having given you my horror story, I have to tell you what is in my heart. CTA, NEA, CFT, all of us lovers of public education, we let this genie out of the box. We were at fault. At the time Gary Hart did this, if he wasn't such a sweetheart and we could all stand up against him, uh, they would have had many, many more years before they could have gotten this legislation through. But you know education is funny. Nobody likes to be behind the curve. They never put a single uh, rule in place to make sure that these schools were innovative. They never put a single rule in place that said what you do in your charter school, you have to bring it back to the Board of Education or to some school district or whoever authorized you so they could pick out the best of what you're doing, which was supposed to have been the point of these experimental schools that were opening up. They never, they did say you can't discriminate, but you know, that's like any other law that you just put on the books and you can look the other way and say that you, how much am I? You can look the other way and say that that uh, you have a, a law in the book to say you can't discriminate. They lost the, the initiative in, uh, in Boston because they educated the parents in Boston that if they did this, they'd have no neighborhood, neighborhood schools because these charter schools don't take the neighborhood kids. But the genie's out the box, and so what do we do? You do what we all do. You try to get them regulated. You try to get some accountability. I don't think we can stop them now. I mean, they are now an integral part of the education system. This word choice is a killer because if you, like these uh, uh, black people come to me and say, you opposed to choice. Yeah, I am opposed to the misuse of the word choice. And you don't have choice if your whole school system is charter. What, what happened to your choice? And you don't have choice if a lottery gets you in and you can't get in that school system. Is that choice? You don't have choice when the school discriminates I mean, I know we were up here. Jerry Brown's got his schools. Um, uh, Shirley Weber is doing something on charter schools. There's no way to turn this clock around to get this thing fixed. We just have to get it regulated and controlled. And the amount of money that's being lost uh, to public education and with DeVos in, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, because they are now going to have a campaign for more choice and more charters. And that ain't nothing but a campaign to break down public education if we've known it. The American Scholar put out a piece last year that said there is no longer a public commitment to public education. They believe now everybody goes to school to make a salary. They don't go to school to have a better country or to make America better or to make America strong. They believe it's just for personal gain. So if you go into school, if you're putting your child in school so your child can make a, a fortune when he or she grows up, they say, hey, you pay for it the best way you can. We're not going to pay for it anymore. So we're in an environment now where 
whatever is public is not necessarily uh, thought to be great as it once was when we created public education. Of course, you all know it was never created for, for black and brown kids. You all know that when public education was created, they weren't even thinking about us. And then we've come along and we made it more difficult because we transferred in, transferred into the system a lot of social maladies that came from things you all don't want to hear about anymore three or four hundred years later, but it's still true. And so it was never, it was never built to educate black and brown kids. And that's when the resentment came in. But after Brown v. Board, when it was clear that you could no longer segregate and that you had to integrate, that's when these things started. You trace it back historically. Don't go back to Gary Hart. Go back to the vouchers. Go back to uh, tech, uh, school tax credits. Go back to the beginning of when we had the nerve to say we were going to put our little black and brown kids in school with your, with your kids. And the reaction set in, just like with the Donald. You don't know how much reaction there is out there until you start down the road. And uh, we are now living in a world with the Donald. I don't want to bring politics into the building of the CTA because I know they don't do politics over here at all. But this is a very precarious time we're living in and a very precarious time for public education. And my message, which I'm taking back, we're doing a forum at our convention in um, July. And what we want to talk about is, is how we regulate and how we get the genie back in the bottle. Because even now, as the chair of the task force, I said, oh, I think our NEA gave us some great data. And I was thinking, well, if you're going to present to 3,000 delegates, you want them to have the best information. So I put a little list together of presenters. And my, my people, my African-American NAACP people wrote me back and said, oh, we, want, we don't want to look biased. We don't want to have too much labor there. Well, what the shit is wrong with having facts come from where they come from and, and putting the best foot forward? And what does it matter who you aligned with if you aligned with the people going the same place you want to go? But, you know, that's politics, and so I'm just letting you know we got them in our association. And so as we go back in July to try to figure out what to do, about this problem, uh, I have uh, sent back about nine more resolutions going underneath this stuff and talking about some of the things that you found in your report. And we don't know what the result will be, but I do know one thing. I do think it's the African Americans community obligation, the Latino and, la and the teachers unions to fix this problem. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I always learn so much when uh, Ms. Huffman speaks. My name is Seth Bramble from California Teachers Association. Those were powerful stories, and I want to make sure we have an opportunity to take your questions uh, for Ms. Huffman. Uh, do uh, folks have questions who are here uh, this morning? I know that uh, one question. Oh, we got one. You were asking about uh, what, where you might be able to see uh, some of the information from the tour that the NAACP did. Is there a way to access some of that information? We have uh, videos from every session except the one in L.A. that I did in L.A. Uh, the video no, we have videos from all. The court reporter did show up there. Uh, the problem is it's the property of the NAACP until I can get it through, uh, all the way through the system. We got one more hearing. Uh, it will be made available. As a part of our report, we are writing up a report uh, that we hope will have some recommendations and actions in it. But if they don't have any recommendations, I still got my eight or nine resolutions I put in. Yeah, we yes, uh, we're in the, in the process of doing a draft before the last uh, hearing in New York, and I'm hopeful that we'll have a draft to take to the convention, and um, the national board of directors will have to sign off on it. But just like we've had all this public uh, uh, to do about nothing as far as I'm concerned, because if you're taking public dollars, you should want to report out on how you're spending them. And like we've took all, taken all this consternation just because we dare raise the question. I even had the Fortune School woman come and, and challenge the NAACP. How dare you raise this question? You should be fighting Betsy DeVos. Their association endorsed her, by the way. But, um, you know, they, we got all this consternation. So we intend to make this stuff public because we want people to know that the NACP is back in this game as we should have been all along. I was curious. I heard stories from Detroit, Boston, New Orleans. I was curious if there were other uh, places uh, that the tour has gone so far and um, what your thoughts might be on some of the other 
locations? We started in Connecticut, uh, and up in Connecticut, we was razzled, we were razzled dazzled by the charter school people. They almost took control of the hearing because they had organized. Can you hear me? And from Connecticut, we went to St. Louis, Missouri. Very different situation there. They have kind of taken their low performance schools and put them in a charter school. Uh, almost similar to what maybe the legislation was supposed to be, but they're controlled mostly by uh, the Department of Education trying to do some innovative work. And from, uh, from St. Louis, we went to Florida. Uh, Florida was, uh, they have, they have, I mean, thank you, Michael. They have some people there that were so, um, so hostile to charter schools that they had almost regular school district people there and very little on the charter schools. But that's because uh, they have a group of African American clergy in Florida that are for, uh, you know, and I haven't, we haven't even gotten to the church schools. And by the way, none of these big corporations sent a single person to any one of our hearings. They just sent the poor little black operators who think they're doing good down here on the ground, not looking at the bigger picture, to come and challenge us. Uh, and so, uh, but I was on uh, Florida, and then we went from Florida to L.A. L.A. was an excellent hearing, uh, and uh, it was balanced. We had both sides there, and that's when Miss Margaret Fortune, one of her fortune schools, came and challenged the NACP, and we had Julian make a presentation. It was a good balanced hearing, and we had some strong support from school administrators because the charter school had their stuff documented. We've been doing public education for so long. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to get a succinct feel of what's, what charters have done, and at the same time, we have to pay attention to the poor performing public schools so that we don't look like we're just out to kill the poor performing charter schools. So it's, it's created a little bit of a wrinkle for us trying to work our way through here uh, but we're doing it. We got a resolution calling on the teachers unions to do something, and we have a resolution that spells out what the ideal public school would be, and we have a great resolution that Julian helped me write on community schools. And so we're taking those resolutions back, and I hope uh, somewhere along the way we'll be fighting this time next year to get this stuff done. And then I see, and then I went to California, and then from California we went to New Detroit. And from Detroit, we went to New Orleans, and our last one is New York. My name is Seth Bramble. I'm here uh, with California Teachers Association. I want to try and be really brief so we can get to our, our next panel, but I do want to highlight two of the other bills that are in your folder. You have fact sheets on those bills. Um, one of them is very closely aligned with some of the um, polling information that was shared by Donald Cohen earlier on the panel from In the Public Interest about uh, transparency and accountability that should be applied in the charter school environment in California. So we do have a bill that we are sponsoring, uh, Assembly Bill 1478 by Assembly Member Joan Sawyer, which clarifies that charter schools must comply with the uh, Brown Act. You may know that as the Open Meetings Act, as well as the Public Records Act, and also two conflict of interest uh, measures, the uh, Political Reform Act, and Government Code 1090. Uh, the second bill that we have in the packet is Senate Bill 808 uh, by Senator Mendoza, which is a bill that uh, crazy talk says that charter schools should locate inside of the school district where they're being authorized, uh, period. That's kind of the whole bill. <laughs> uh, so those are the two proposals very much focused around not just accountability and transparency, that first one, but also an element of local control uh, in the second provision. There's been uh, two kind of recent conversations at the Capitol. One where a, a charter school sometimes will locate temporarily outside of the school district where it's being authorized. And in that case, it can be very challenging to, um, if, if it's not a good learning environment for kids, to figure out who you would go to uh, to have that oversight. If you're not a constituent in the in the district, uh, you can't necessarily contact the school board member. And in a worst case scenario, if you contact the authorizer and they're not uh, doing effective oversight, it can be really hard to ensure that they're doing that work if you're not even in that school district and they're not even serving kids from in their school district. So that's really challenging. Uh, the second thing has been, there's been kind of a routine situation where charter schools, it was discussed in the past, have been denied locally but then granted uh, approval on appeal by a body that's not the local school district, not the folks that that community has elected to represent 
uh, and create the best learning environment for the kids in their community. So we want to return to what we see as how charter schools were initially intended, which was locally driven, community driven innovation, and uh, empower those local school board members to be making decisions about what works best for the kids in their community. So uh, with that, I do want to bring up a panel of uh, folks, I don't want to say folks on the ground, stories from the classroom, uh, the stories from uh, Livermore about um, uh, charter schools in that area. Welcome. And I kind of titled what I was writing today, uh, TVLC, A Charter School Destruction Story. And we don't have statistics. We have our experiences. And so we appreciate that you're letting us um, share them with y'all. We urge you closely to consider the need um, for charter school reform in California, especially in regards to the financing aspects of how charter schools are currently allowed to operate in our state. And in, I guess, the 12 years that Laura and I have been involved, we've been on both sides of the line. And I told my college kids now that moms come full circle in this story. Um, and they told me to go get them today. Um, today we want to put a story to the staggering statistics that surround what many of you know is the Tri-Valley Learning Corporation. And it's one of the featured um, components of um, Dr. Loeffler's uh, research. Um, in 2005, the Livermore Valley Charter School um, opened, and we were the largest startup charter school in the state of California, with 525 students spanning grades, uh, grades K through 6. The school emerged as a grassroots reaction to the closure of two popular magnet schools that were located within our district. Over a two-year period, a core group of educators and parents, Ms. Morgan and I being part of this, join forces to lay the foundation of opening this school. While other families helped in ancillary committees to gather the needed resources to make the school a reality once it was approved. Hundreds of hours were spent by these families to create an educational option within Livermore that partnered both educators and parents in a vision that under charter law allowed for more flexible use of student dollars in a way that educational dollars could be spent more directly in the classroom. Essentially, we hope to kind of take away the layers of county and local district bureaucracy. In the first two years, um, we ran a very lean budget, and as teachers, we were seriously underpaid um, compared to the surrounding districts, but we were cited to work at LBCS because within the classroom, we created an outstanding educational program utilizing principles of strategic design and the concept of educating the whole child. We offered an integrated, and not only um, education per the state standards, but we worked very hard to incorporate art and music and foreign language on a daily basis within our school. While the districts at this point in our area were cutting back and um, not allowing these things to be in the classroom, we were able to kind of spend those educational dollars in a way that helped um, the students. Um, in these founding years, a family was created, a family that many wanted to be a part of. And very early on, our wait list was hundreds deep um, from the local community. Fiscal challenges faced our school in year three and four, and expansion was considered. Um, one expansion was to create a high school because many of our sixth grade students were now eighth grade and graduating. Um, and these challenges and fiscal issues concerned the state at that point who was our authorizer enough to require that we had um, oversight from FICMAP. As the school emerged from this oversight, a number of new board members were elected by the parent constituents. In my opinion, some of these members did not have the best interest of the school and its education of children in the forefront of their mind. Instead, they started to figure out that perhaps the school's success could be branded. And worse yet, they could make the corporation some money. By this time, the school and its management had gone from LVCS to the Livermore Charter Learning Corporation as we attempted to start our high schools in Livermore, and then to a new corporate entity called the Tri-Valley Learning Corporation as they <clears throat> newly elected members tried to open schools out of the surrounding Livermore district. At this point, 
um, educator and family voices began to be shut out. It was finalized in 2010 when the sitting board changed corporate bylaws in such a way that the attending family's democratic voice was taken away in exchange for corporate board appointments. All of this was done in a series of special meetings and closed sessions. Suddenly, our voices, parents, and educators was gone. Many of us employees who questioned what occurred were told to be happy we had jobs. Yet, because we believed in our original dream and we did a great job every day within our classrooms, we mistakenly did as they threatened. We stayed quiet, encouraging those parents who could speak up, especially about this pressure to expand into Dublin, into the local high school. They tried to start uh, an, uh, an academy called Portola Academy to serve especially the students that Dr. Huffman was speaking about, and finally the schools in Stockton and Acacia. The line was always given to us that using the LVCS ADA money was okay right now because it was once the new schools would be secured in their funding and their Title I money, it would be put back into our classrooms. We were working, as I say, with bubble gum and chew strings. We didn't have curriculum. I bought it personally most of the time. We all did. But we made it work because we believed. As Mr. Leffler spoke about, the whole bond funding issue at this point started to drift around at um, TVLC. And there was a whole group of entities of previous um, employees and board members who were now heads of these corporations and shuffling this money around. Um, but at, in an at-will contract situation, it was hard to question what was going on. By 2015, some, uh, some democratic reforms were enacted by TVLC in a veiled attempt to placate those of us who were getting a little loud. Um, with this idea of a site council model that allowed the TVL school sites to advance members to the corporate board, but they would still always need corporate approval. These seat distributions, however, were not based at populations at each site, but instead of just the site. So LBCS had a population of 1,200 students. The Acacia schools had a total population of about 300 students, but yet they had more votes in this corporate structure than the largest school did. Um, and so it was very hard to get any reforms put through. Last year, everything kind of blew up. Uh, thanks to the tenacity of a, current, of a number of current and former Liver, uh, Livermore parents, pressure on TVLC continued. And finally, the Frisures were revealed by what I call a group of concerned parent investigators. Following that, the New Jerusalem School District and the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District started issuing notices of concern and then notices of violation. TVLC placated and played a manipulative blame game to buy time. Then, this time last year, we got an email that our paychecks weren't going to get paid, that we would have to wait. It was April 1st, taxes were due, mortgages were due, rents were due. Teachers came crying, what are we going to do? Underpaid many of these teachers and living in a high cost community, many being young and living paycheck to paycheck, we mobilized. At a joint meeting, we aired three pages of concerns and grievances. We received no response. We continued to mobilize. A few of us stood up and spoke for the staff. We could afford to lose our jobs if TVLC decided to retaliate in their at-will dismissal procedures. I continued to mobilize. Laura continued to mobilize. By late May, it came to light that not only was TVLC not able to pay our paychecks, they were not paying our STRS. They were even not paying the portion of our STRS that we were contributing. And to this date, I'm not quite sure if my STRS has ever been corrected and finalized. They were also using our withdrawals for short-term cash, for all of our insurance premiums, and um, AFLAC and premiums, and things like that. So we were all of a sudden getting bills and notices that we were in arrears, when in good faith, 
And according to our paychecks, we weren't. They embezzled money. And it was their fiduciary responsibility not to. They were stealing. We mobilized, and quickly, by the 1st of June, we submitted an intent to unionize petition that encompassed all of the bargaining units, nearly 90% participation from the staff at both the local charter school, elementary, and the local high school. In, at, in a week. In a week. Um, we didn't have acacia support, but they were under closure procedures at this point in time, and that was the school in Stockton. We were proud, and we wanted to regain control of a school that we started, but we were too late. And the controlling members of the TVLC board refused to acknowledge our voice. It was time to go. We moved, we walked, and we scattered to the winds. The heart of the educational program left. 25 teachers walked away. Hopefully now, the death knell is rattling. And we ask you to please take an interest in reforming charter school management, especially in this financial area where they have the ability to borrow unencumbered amounts of money. It is not fair to see that the money goes unchecked and is taken away from local districts. Our district on average spends at least 10 to 15 unaccounted for administrative hours dealing with the shenanigans of this CML corporation. Um, my name is Laura Morgan and I was a founding educator at LVCS in 2005. All three of my sons attended LVCS, the oldest two uh, through eighth grade and my youngest this year uh, through the beginning of sixth grade. Um, my oldest son attended LVCP for three years and this summer, as I'll explain later, uh, we moved him to a local high school um, due to uh, the loss of WASC accreditation. I'm here today to share my story um, about what happened at TVLC uh, how they mismanaged LVCS's and LVCP's money and tore apart a really strong, vibrant community. And sort of in terms of timeline, I'm picking up where Jen left off. So at the beginning of the 2016-17 school year, we began school with several hundred fewer students than the previous year. So at this point, LVCS had been at about 1,200 kids uh, the previous year, and we were down to about 800 at that point. Um, with kids trickling out almost every day. Our principal had resigned to move the previous spring and our two assistant principals resigned weeks before school started. Uh, many of the teachers had moved on to teaching positions elsewhere. Those of us that were left, uh, that were teacher leaders, were trying to step up and fill a vacuum of leadership, uh, but we couldn't because there was no information flowing to us. To say that teachers felt demoralized at this point was an understatement. We started school without any curriculum having been ordered for us. Uh, we had supplies that, although they had been ordered, weren't delivered because the accounts hadn't been paid. The bathrooms hadn't even been cleaned since the previous June. So we started with dirty bathrooms. Uh, we had problems with rodents in our classroom and rodent droppings on a daily basis. Um, Parents came back to school ready to fight for the school they loved and it became very apparent very quickly that the school was no longer the school that it had been and everybody was shocked to see the drastic downturn everything had taken. Uh, the students realized that many of their friends that they had you know, been in class with the previous years were gone from their classrooms and we were, in leaders, we were leaderless and we were in despair. So due to so many kids being gone, uh, quickly layoffs became a possibility. Management refused to meet with our fledgling, fledgling union to even discuss the protocol of layoffs, let alone to even begin to negotiate a contract with us. We were told seniority would not be a consideration, and so all of us, from the most newbie teacher to the veterans, felt that our jobs were on the line. Uh, Every day we drove to school wondering if today would be the day we would lose our job. The stress was immense. Eventually the day of the layoffs came and the process was demoralizing. Several veteran LVCS teachers lost their job right alongside some of our newer teachers. 
The day after layoffs, one of my colleagues, Audrey Zika, had a heart attack. She would kept her job. Her teenage daughter found her, performed CPR, called 911, and after several days it was determined she had no brain activity and she passed away after being taken off of life support. Although we have no imperial pr proof in our hearts and minds as her colleagues, we all felt that the stress that TVLC had put us all through led to Audrey's death. And her children, who had been our students, Emma and Noah, will now go through the rest of their lives without their mother. For me personally, Audrey's death was a wake-up call. I had known I needed to get out, but now I knew I really needed to get out. It was a matter of life and death. I was waking up every morning with panic attacks. Um, I could barely function in my regular life, although I was trying mightily to keep the stress out of the classroom. Right about that time, parents that were still at LVCS began looking for a solution with the local school district for where the students could all go in the event of, an, of a mass exodus from LVCS. LVJUSD, our local district, worked tirelessly to ready a school site uh, hire teachers, enroll students, LA fairs, and begin to build a new community that was a soft place for all of us to land, educators, families, and students. On November 14, 2016, the satellite campus opened with 13 former LVCS teachers and 300 former LVCS TK through 5 students. So at this point, it left about 300 kids at LVCS out of the 1200. roughly 1,200 that had been there the previous school year. Um, a few weeks later, LVJUSD middle schools welcomed uh, former LVCS students into their schools with over 50, 50 students transferring to Christi Christensen Middle School alone, one of whom was my uh, youngest son. Again, the district and the individual schools worked tirelessly to make the transition for the students as seamless as possible. LVJUSD has gone above and beyond the call of duty to create caring, nurturing environments for former LVCS students, families, and educators alike. Countless hours were spent planning, preparing, and readying the schools, and I applaud the district for their commitment to all Livermore students. I mourn the loss of the community that I helped to create 12 years ago. I miss the families and the students with whom I used to work. I miss watching the students that I had had in first grade and transitional kindergarten grow up to be the big kids on campus. Mm -hmm. I miss my colleagues, though, though I feel so fortunate to work alongside many of them at the satellite campus. I think of all of the rest of them every day, and I mourn not being able to still learn with and alongside them as a professional. Many of them I'd worked with for over a decade, and it sometimes feels like I lost a limb. I worry for my colleagues who still want to leave LVCS but have not yet found, it, found their safe place to land. I think of them daily and hope their opportunity comes soon. Once proud to have helped start LVCS, an outstanding school where all three of my sons attended, I now mourn what has become a tarnished reputation. Much of what people now hear about LVCS is negative, and those who never knew our school assume it was a terrible place. It was not. It was magical, a place created by a grassroots efforts of educators and families and designed to be a community in which learners were looked at as, a whole, as whole people and educated as such. For 12 years of my life, I poured my blood, sweat, and tears into that school, and its legacy is ever, forever tarnished by a cabal of greedy people. Besides my own transition, this situation has taken a toll on my family. My oldest son was forced to transfer from LVCP, the high school, to a local high school for his senior year. A child who has not always been comfortable in his own skin, he was so excited to spend senior year and graduate alongside his lifelong friends. That dream was shattered for him when LVCP lost its WASC accreditation over the summer, and we were forced to finally admit defeat and enroll him at Granada High School. Although he has endured and even thrived this year, I know he will always wonder what could have been, and there will always be a bitterness that cannot be erased. My youngest one was one of over the 50 students who transferred to Christensen Middle School after Thanksgiving of 2016. And although for him that transition has been pretty smooth, um, we miss the time that we used to share together. I no longer am able to drive him to school every day. Kristen does. <laughs> and uh, he's no longer able to come into my classroom after school. I was able to have my kids at the same school as me from uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, and now my youngest won't have that experience, and I mourn the experiences he won't have at LVCS that his older brothers did. 
Please do not allow another community to be torn apart as LVCS has been and LVCP. The lives of real people are affected, including the most vulnerable, whom we as educators have sworn to support, the children. Charter schools must be held to the same accountability and transparency standards as every other public, public school. They should not be ripe for exploitation by business people looking to make a buck off the backs of our children. I was a charter school parent for six years and a member of a charter school board of directors for eight months from December of 2015 until August of 2016. I left the board and the charter school at the beginning of the current school year and my only child is now finishing his sixth grade year at a public district middle school. Going back in time, my son started at LVCS in kindergarten. Before he started school, I spoke to and visited two neighborhood public schools a local Montessori private school, and a charter school. In other words, we were active parents. We wanted to make the very best choice for our son. The charter school had a substantial wait list in all of its grades and held a lottery for kindergarten admission. But we were lucky, and our number was chosen. As we considered our options, we knew that LVCS was the best choice for our family and our son. We enrolled him, and we were very pleased as he progressed through elementary school. The school had excellent teachers and excellent educational programs, excellent school administration, and a wonderful community of families. Parents were involved in the school and in the classrooms. P communication with teachers was superb, and our son thrived. However, as the years passed, my family began to realize that there were problems in the management above the school, namely the board and the CEO, in terms of transparency and accountability and the direction that they were taking the schools. As a parent, I felt that it was not possible to influence the direct direction of the CMO and that it was extremely distant from parents and teachers. It seemed to me that the management took on the aura of a business trying to grow and expand with less of focus on our school. I never felt the board sought any input from families as the board pursued its expansion plans. To my knowledge, there was never any discussion of how this would affect current families, mm -hmm. the staff, or whether the current community even wanted to expand. In my opinion, the CMO was losing its connection to the grassroots movement that had started such an incredible school. I wanted to make changes, so I tried very hard to become a board member. Eventually, I did, as a school site member, um, in December of 2015, in my son's fifth grade year. I personally wanted to be responsive to the concerns and needs of the parent and school community, but even while on the board, I struggled with how to make that happen. As problems began to mount throughout the spring, there were meetings with over 100 parents in attendance and parents pleading for information, and yet they were given none. The parents made suggestions, but were ignored. A lot of business was conducted in closed session. It was incredibly painful to listen to the parents' distress about what might happen as the school faced a multitude of problems and a very uncertain future. I ached as teachers cried about their jobs and their paychecks and not getting their stirs paid. Parents and teachers wanted information and had no way of getting it. Authorizers issued multiple notices of concern and notices of violation. It was an extraordinarily volatile time. By the end of the school year, the principal resigned. Over the summer, as Laura said, many teachers resigned, and I knew many more were actively looking for jobs. Notices of concern and violation continued to be issued. Parents did begin to, began to leave in large numbers, and in August, the vice principals both resigned. My family was on vacation out of state, but from 2,000 miles away, and with less than a week and a half before school was going to start, we began to finally come to terms with the fact that the school we had all loved so much was not going to be the same, and we feared that it would not even survive the next school year. On our flight home, my husband and I continued to try to hash out the best school choice for our family. We felt the supreme sense of urgency as the first day of school was so close. As we drove home from the airport, we stopped and visited two of the local public school district options for middle school. We didn't even take our suitcases home first. <laughs> the first school already had been swamped with ex-charter families, and they didn't think they would have any sixth grade openings. I began to feel a bubble of panic as we left and drove to the second school. To my great relief, they could accommodate our son. We took the transfer paperwork home and filled it out that night. My husband and I, who had six years earlier been so proactive in making a choice in education, made another difficult choice. It was time to leave the charter school. 
The next morning, we turned in the district paperwork, and I submitted my resignation from the board. Over the course of the summer and the early months of the school year, hundreds of other families made that same difficult choice. In less than six months, the school population of the TK-8 to school, which had had over 1,100, almost 1,200 students, with a wait list of hundreds in June, had dropped to somewhere in the 300s. Each of those families has their own story to tell, and I wish you could hear them all. They are filled with anger, sadness, regret, frustration, grief, deep hurt, and a sense of betrayal. I would run into former charter school families at the grocery store, Target, Walmart, and they would tell me their stories of leaving and how much it hurt their kids to say goodbye. The charter community that meant so much to me was scattered across five district middle schools, even more elementary schools, and beyond. No one set out to move away from the charter. Everyone I talked to had hoped for a different ending. But despite their best efforts, the parents and teachers had no power to bring about change. And in the end, they chose what they felt was their best option, albeit a painful and sad one. Perhaps surprisingly, I still believe in choice, albeit choice with regulation. Tougher oversight is needed, so this never happens to another family or another community. Laura and Jennifer told you some of the many problems of management. Even more problems are documented in the public record of over a dozen notices of concern and over a half dozen notices of violation issued by PVLC's authorizers, including alleged conflicts of interest, unsafe school environments, financial mismanagement such as not properly paying retirement accounts, intimidation of parents by violating free speech laws and failing to meet state requirements for audits. As of November 2016, the corporation is in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Two of the four schools that they manage have already announced that because of financial problems, they will close next year. Based on my experiences, this is what I have learned. The purpose of education is to serve the community. To that end, educators, including charter schools, have two obligations. First, to the students in their schools, and second, to the community and the taxpayers. Both obligations are essential. Currently, as I understand it, in cases of charter violations, the primary cause for revocation must be academic performance. In my opinion, that shirks the equally important responsibility that a charter school has to the taxpayers and to the community. Charter schools must be good stewards of public funding and the public trust. Therefore, I urge you to, one, strengthen and enforce legislation that prohibits conflicts of interest for charter operators and management companies. Charter schools should operate for the benefit of our children and our local community and not private business interests. Two, pass legislation that makes it impossible for people or private entities to unfairly financially benefit from public funding to charters. Three, hold charter schools to the same accountability and transparency laws as public district schools. Four, Create policies that ensure that charter school management is responsive to parents and the local community. For example, I believe that charter boards should be directly elected and locally controlled, just as district school boards are. Parents and the community should be empowered to recall board members. As you contemplate regulation of charter schools, I hope you will remember that charter school failures affect more than just the families and students who attend these charter schools. When a charter school fails, the public school district where those children end up and the entire local community are impacted. The school my son now attends added 110 former charter schools to its enrollment from the end of last year until today. That is an increase of almost 20% in their population. That kind of sudden increase is a challenge for any school. I am certain that the district, its staff, administration, teachers, and the fellow students all felt the repercussions from the unexpected influx of new students. Although I must say, in my opinion, they handled the crush of students with great aplomb. Finally, please remember that education is a public trust. We must safeguard it and ensure that our children and communities are the sole beneficiaries of public funding and that that public funding is used responsibly. You started your school. It was a little neighborhood charter school, mm -hmm. yes. right? Yeah. So how did you get into Klein with, with the corporate entity? <laughs> Jennifer, you want to pick that one? Here, yes, I can, I can try. So 
When I was thinking about it, it's like the, the black thing in the Wrinkle in Time book. It just kind of came on us. And I, the, the, the easiest way to kind of think about it is we started and we were local and we were, you know, kind of a, made our little corporation. And then as we started to expand, that corporation began to take on its new life. And as some of our board members, I think, went to the CCSA conferences and they started to figure out um, how the financing worked and how the board um, and how the bonds worked and things like that, I think they perhaps started to see stars in their eyes and saw that maybe we could expand and take our brand um, and make it look like some of those really large charter entities. And um, they made steps from the ground up to change the corporate structure, pushing us all out, keeping us at a distance, as, as um, Mrs. Cohen said, threatening us um, in very kind of subtle ways many times. And so it evolved into that um, to the point where it became TBLC. And um, that kind of CMO needs to stop as well versus just coming and you know, making a bucket of schools. I think one of the, the most interesting pieces was this CMO kind of came out of people who had been maybe somehow at least at the very beginning involved. And they, they did get stars in their eyes and they did see this opportunity. I mean, the joke for all of us has been, what did they all sit down with pizza and beer one day and say, hey, I know how we can cheat a whole lot of kids and make a whole lot of money. Um, but that wasn't really how it happened. I think over time, it was people who were part of our community that we trusted. And because we trusted them, we weren't watching them nearly as closely as we could have. And they became, they became educated in ways of how they could grow the business. And, um, and it, it went from there. It was, it was a monster from within. I'm sorry, gang, <laughs> but I'm doing my research. So, were your schools diverse in the beginning? Did you have certificated teachers in the beginning? The diversity piece was always an original challenge for us at LBCS, um, much because of the way the original petition was structured. Um, it allowed for founding families in year one, and because many of our founding families came out of this magnet school shutdown piece, um, we mirrored the statistics of the district, but we did not mirror the district itself had schools that were much more diverse than others. So we kind of sort of mirrored the whole district, but we didn't at the same time mirror some of the schools um, in, in our balances. And um, so that, and then over time, because it was a lottery draw, um, it was kind of luck of the draw. So we did a lot of outreach. And in the latest span of petitions, that we were working with the local school district to begin to put in place some ways to make it more diverse and open to the community. But with that original lottery draw, the kindergarten draw on the wait list, it made it difficult. Um, but that almost became a, a moot point in the way that the money was rolling in and we never even saw it at the ground level. I think it's interesting too. Livermore is not a hugely diverse community. It is in some pockets and in some pockets not. Um, and that became um, a challenge for us. And one of the things the corporation was looking to do was to open a school within the Livermore community that did serve um, lower socioeconomic uh, population. And um, that actually got squashed by the local community pretty quickly. That was something that was already actually being done quite well by the local school district. It wasn't a need in the community, and well, they the, money. It, the, the, the corporation, the CMO, wanted the money, um, and they wanted the Title I money, and that was what led to the opening of the schools in Stockton, uh, because that was the population that could be, frankly, exploited. Um, in terms of certificated teachers, our original goal was yes, all everybody was certificated, and even um, some of the the specialists who didn't necessarily need to under charter law be certificated. It read in our charter, which we wrote, <laughs> um, that we wanted everybody to be certificated. <clears throat> As time went along, uh, that got bent, 
during last year, the charter school was under the, uh, the local district as an authorizer, and they did issue a notice of concern regarding the lack of diversity. Um, Jennifer and I were on the school council, and we spent a lot of time drafting up a response to that. We recognized that it was a problem, and we developed a an action plan for it. That bo that plan did go to the board, and it was approved. I cannot say that anything that was in that plan has been implemented. I left the board in August, but to my knowledge, um, not. But I would not speak authoritatively to that. But the district was concerned about it and did mm -hmm. did make its point. Uh, another interesting thing. So when we first opened, we were housed in an older uh, local district school that had been closed for many years. And so we were down in the neighborhood uh, where the kids actually lived. When the whole bond operation uh, to build our own school happened, we ended up moving up on the hill. Um, where nobody lives. It's actually behind Costco. <laughs> and, uh, and so that actually was a challenge with uh, our diversity because the, the kids who were able to get up the hill were not the kids who needed... That they'd go to the local school. Yeah, they, they were able to get to their local schools, but to get up to the hill, it was a much more difficult challenge. Um, none of us ever wanted to move up to the hill. <laughs> it was kind of foisted on us. And now in looking back, we all think we should have fought a lot harder against that. Uh, my name is Vanessa. I am a member of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, which is a coalition of youth, community, and public system leaders, as well as policy researchers, to advocate and work to ensure that the most vulnerable youth have the tools and supports they need into healthy, successful adulthood so that they can contribute to California's social and economic vitality. Working at the state and local level, the Alliance is actively pursuing reforms to increase access to health services, improve academic success, support neighborhood safety, reduce justice system involvement, and support employment opportunities for the population of young people. At the Alliance, we aim to ensure that young people have supportive and safe learning environments that allow them to be successful no matter what the circumstance. We are invested in fighting for the guaranteed rights and protections of all of our students with a critical morale and keeping schools accountable to using fair disciplinary practices and non-discriminatory admissions policies. The Alliance for Boys and Men of Color is co-sponsoring Assembly Bill 1360 because it helps ensure that charter schools are part of our educational system, public education, provide fair access to all students regardless of their family circumstances, where they were born, how they look, who they love, or the language in which they speak. At Each One Reach One, a member of the Alliance, we believe it's our mission to support educational practices that positions and empowers our under-resourced young people to thrive in this ever-changing world. Much as uh, Professor Lafer said, um, when you talk about economic impact reports, people's eyes sort of glaze over. So I'm going to try and uh, make it as exciting as economic impact reports can be, because I actually think they are very exciting. Um, and here's why. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the, the why, what, and how of an economic impact report. But first, some background. Um, I'm actually a CPA, as well as a researcher and, and data analyst. And part of the reason why I went to uh, school and, and uh, sat through the tests and was a forensic accountant at a big four accounting firm for a while is because I actually really strongly believe in fiduciary duties, right? Um, you've heard that mentioned throughout um, the day today is fiduciary duties. And, and what is fiduciary duty, okay? I think it's a moral obligation. And a fiduciary duty is actually composed of multiple things. It's composed of duty of care, 
um, duty of loyalty, duty of prudence, and duty of disclosure. And all these things are things that the economic impact report deals with. So, so why do you want to do an economic impact report, and why do I actually think it's not just a prudent obligation, a prudent fiscal obligation to undertake economic reports, I think it's also a moral obligation if you are taking your job seriously as a school board member, um, uh, taking your fiduciary duty seriously. So why do you want to do an EIR? There have been massive industry shifts in the charter school, in the public education sector. Um, since 2000, the number of charter schools has grown by 319%. That's, that's not three times, that's 319%. In LAUSD alone, in just 10 years, we've seen a 265% growth rate. Okay, imagine a sector like Coca-Cola. If Coca-Cola saw one sector of the industry like orange juice grow by 265%, you can 100% bet that Coca-Cola would commission a study about how this impacts their revenues and expenses, right? Um, and so, and I also want to frame this as like, what does the future look like, right? CCSA has announced a stated goal of March to 1 million by 2022. The Broad Walmart plan in Los Angeles that was leaked had a stated goal of taking half of LAUSD students into, into uh, privately operated charter schools. It's irresponsible to see this growth rate. It's irresponsible to know that, these, uh, that this is what's forecasted and this is what people are trying to do and not say to yourself, as a fiduciary, we need to understand the economic impacts, right? Especially when, as our studies have shown and as multiple studies across the nation have shown, that charter schools are accompanied not just by decreased revenue, but by increased costs. Right? Um, any industry that is experiencing such changes would be prudent and frankly I think morally obligated to understand those impacts because fiscal impacts are educational impacts. So what is an EIR? So that's the why of an EIR, right? What is an EIR? It's an accounting of the fiscal impacts of charter school growth, that's all, right? That, that's literally all it is. It's, it's taking the dollars and cents and saying what happens. Um, it's the revenue and expense impact. So in, in, uh, in California, with the funding system, uh, revenue follows the kids, right? So it's, it's, an, it's based on ADA, um, and it's based on, uh, so, so when a charter school student, or when a public school student leaves a public school district for a charter school, the revenue follows the kids. However, as Professor Lafer pointed out, not all of the expenses immediately follow the children, right? Things like you could lose one student, but that doesn't mean you've lost one teacher, right? You've gone from 28 students to 27 students, right? Um, other uh, things also stay behind in the, uh, in the public school district. Um, there's this thing in the insurance industry, I've done some consulting in, in a past life for the insurance industry called adverse selection. How many of y'all have heard of this term? It's a fun term, um, and what this means, adverse selection means when a company deliberately chooses less expensive, um, less expensive customers or more profitable customers and leaves behind for their competitors the less profitable customers. And you've heard rumors, and you've seen numbers, and we've provided numbers that show that adverse selection absolutely is happening. And that's what an economic impact report does. It takes those rumors, of adverse selection and quantifies them and says, is this actually happening? Is adverse selection happening? Are charter schools actually taking the, the, more expen or the, the less expensive to educate kids and leaving the more expensive kids behind? And the answer is yes. Our economic impact report, which by the way, was performed by an um, outside nationally recognized um, education consultant, found that it was true. Not only are charter schools and LAUSD taking half, take, taking less of the special education children, they have half of the, of the most expensive to educate special education children. I was um, an autism therapist at one point. Um, so for example, they'll take, um, they'll take uh, 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 certain children with uh, certain disorders, but leave children with autism behind. Children with autism, some studies have shown that it can cost up to 20,000 more a year to educate children with autism. So those are the children that the charter schools don't target and don't market to, and they leave behind. And that's an example of adverse selection. An economic impact report takes that discrepancy and quantifies it and says, what does this cost? Um, 
it's also cost management accounting, which I know you've already like, what? But cost management accounting just says, let's look at our direct and indirect costs. You have direct costs, right? Like the money leaves with the students, the costs increase when you take this type of student and not the other type of student. But there's also indirect costs. What our economic impact report found, or what the independent consultants economic impact report found, is that there are huge amounts of indirect costs caused by charter schools that have not even been measured or quantified. For example, in LAUSD, they now have to run separate charter school sections of the LAUSD board meetings that can take, that can take anywhere from four to six hours. Those costs are not quantified. Think about amount, the amount of time um, of staff to run those meetings, the amount of copies, everything from time to materials that is that has to happen in order to support what's happening with charter schools that is never quantified, never paid for, never measured. Um, so that's the what. It's simply an attempt to quantify and forecast the impact of charter schools on the traditional public school systems because what gets measured gets managed. How can you responsibly me manage uh, a school district without knowing what's happening in this sector of your industry, right? So now, how do you do an EIR? So um, one thing that you've heard, um, I think also as a theme, is um, CCSA doesn't argue with the facts. They just love ad hominem attacks, right? They don't say, hey, you're wrong. They say, hey, we don't like you. Hey, you're biased, right? So something like, I think, Professor Lafer's report, it's a 60-page report with hundreds of citations. They haven't argued with a single fact in Professor Lafer's report, right? They've just said, Professor Lafer's a union guy, right? Um, and we saw something similar. I, we've heard that they, that happened with the NAACP. The NAACP's moratorium resolution is extremely well laid out cites a lot of sources, but did they go after any of those facts? No, they just said the NAACP should be fighting Betsy DeVos, who, by the way, we endorsed. Um, so, so that's what they do, and they did that with our EIR, too. So we, and we knew that they would do that with our EIR. So what did we do? What we did was we actually, I actually did not do the EIR. Um, we hired MGT of America, which is a nationally recognized consulting firm specializing in, um, in the public sector and in education. And they actually did a similar study hired by a school district. They were actually hired by Nashville School District to do an impact report of charter schools, the first of its kind in the country. And LAUSD was only the second type of this study. So we did not, and we actually did not touch any of the data. We didn't perform any of the analysis. We just contracted with this third-party consultant and said, we want you to do this independent, good, bad, and ugly. We just want to see what your results say. And so that's one of the, the major things that we did was hire an independent consultant who specializes in this. Um, because again, we see that CCSA's, CCSA's main line of attack is always going to be an ad hominem attack rather than on the facts. Um, second of all, you need cooperation from your school district and all parties. We are very lucky that at the time of our uh, fiscal impact report, uh, um, uh, our superintendent uh, was in many ways a visionary and saw that this needed to happen. And frankly, you know, offline also admitted that they probably should have done it a while ago. Um, so, so he gave a directive to all his staff that they needed to cooperate with these consultants and, so, and to make themselves available for interviews, to provide data, and to help with any analysis that needed to happen. So those are the two things that we found to be helpful for us, partly because of just the breadth of LAUSD. LAUSD is the second largest school district in the country, but the uh, top charter school authorizer in the country with 221 charter schools. So by far, we have the most charter schools in the country. So it was a little bit of a, a complicated system, as you can imagine. So what I'm going to do really quickly is just go over the results. So you know, what is the point of all this? You, I told you about the who, the, the why, and the what, and the how. And then so what actually happens? So let me just go through this really quickly. Um, uh, so you can see that th these are actually the, the independent consultants who, perf who performed this analysis. Again, I did not perform this analysis. Utility did not. A nationally recognized consulting firm, who, by the way, has been hired to recommend school closures in other parts of the country, right? So they're not a union friendly. They're, we were actually the first time they'd ever worked with a union. Let me make that clear. They'd never worked with a union before. They've only been hired before this by actual government entities and by school districts. Um, and frankly, we would in, in other parts of the country, we've probably protested their findings. So, um, so they are definitely independent. Um, so, let's see. I'm just going to go through. Okay, so let me go through uh, some of this. So, 
The total fiscal impact as of last year was over half a billion dollars in LAUSD. That's with the 221 charter schools. So every single year at the current percentage of charter school students, LAUSD has a net impact. That's not total revenue loss. That's, that's revenues after expenses, a net impact of over half a billion dollars. Think about what that means in terms of music classes, arts education, supplies, all that thing. So half a billion dollars. And it's broken down into these sorts of things. So I'm going to go over some of the most interesting findings just so you can see, like, what, does an, what can an economic impact report show you? Because you're like, oh, of course we sort of know what charter schools are costing us. But when you dig into it, you can see what's actually happening, right? So this is why I'm talking about cost accounting. Um, so uh, authorizers can charge up to between 1% and 3% um, to cover to cover oversight costs. But what we're finding is that that oversight revenue does not cover the full cost of oversee does not cover the full direct cost. Remember I talked about indirect costs? Does not cover the full direct cost. So we're already running a deficit on um, of 3.3 million because authorizers cannot charge for the full cost of their authorization. So what does this mean? This means that you're fundamentally placing authorizers with a choice in a choice. Are you going to properly authorize and regulate charter schools so you don't have Livermore happen? Or are you by taking money from classrooms with, with traditional public school students? That's the only way. What this is telling us is the only way to properly authorize and regulate charter schools is to take money out of the classrooms where traditional public school students have been left behind. So you are either shortchanging public school students or you're shortchanging charter school students when you're not allowing us to charge the full cost of, of uh, oversight. For additional direct oversight activities, so that 3.3 million deficit that I talked about, that fundamental choice, do we, do, we, do we leave behind traditional public school students or do we leave charter school students hanging to the tender mercies of these nonprofit management organizations? That doesn't even touch the fact that special education, because of the adverse selection I talked about, that's almost a million dollars in d direct oversight activities. And the Office of the Inspector General also um, gets, uh, incurs almost half a million dollars in additional costs to help oversee charter schools for, over, for almost 1.5 million of additional direct oversight activities outside of the charter school division. So th this is what I'm talking about, indirect time and opportunity costs, right? Um, this is when district staff spend time managing or dealing with charter schools rather than district schools. So for example, there's an entire office of school choice at LAUSD. That's not paid for by charter schools. LAUSD does not get extra money to pay for, for that office. It's paid for, again, by money that should be going to the classrooms for the public school students that have been left behind, right? Um, so these hours and efforts have not been identified, gathered, or quantified. The independent consultant used a model that they've used in other places to come up with an estimated cost of $13.9 in indirect costs um, for other uh, time and opportunity costs. I'm going to skip that one. This one. Uh, okay, so now this is the one that I really want to talk about because one thing you'll notice is that the cost is unclear. The reason that the cost is unclear is because it is so hard to quantify adverse selection costs, right? Because special education revenue in LAUSD is extremely, I mean, and throughout California, is, uh, is impacted by AB 602. This penalizes schools that have higher percentage of identified students of higher needs than students in the charter schools. Basically what this is, is this is, um, this is a perverse incentive. We have a saying in forensic accounting, where you, where you see perverse incentives, you will find perversity, right? So basically what the funding formula has said, I saw somebody laugh, thank you. Um, what you see is that the funding formula incentivizes underserving the highest need students. And when you incentivize that, what do you do? You see charter schools underserving the highest need students. So LAUSD is a significantly higher proportion of high need and high cost special ed students compared to the independent charter schools in the district. That's the reference I was talking to about earlier. Um, there's another thing, SELPAs. You all know what SELPAs are, right? So SELPAs are the thing that like, um, they're a special education local plan area uh, that uh, uh, charters, I mean, sorry, that school districts can sort of form into clusters of so that uh, they can uh, properly serve their special education students. However, California has this, so even though it's called a local plan area, it's, that's a misnomer, you can actually join a SELPA anywhere in the state. Many charter schools at one point in LAUSD were joining the El Dorado SELPA 3,000 miles away, right? Why? Because El Dorado was cheaper, 
right? And so what happens is because LUC said this is not working out, when you go to El Dorado, you're underserving our special ed students. We still feel a responsibility because there still are students, even though they're in charter schools. So what they did was there's now a race to the bottom. LAUSD signed a memorandum of understanding with their charter schools to incentivize them to rejoin LAUSD SILPA by basically subsidizing special education, uh, the special education local plan area for independent charter schools. Total cost of this is $10.4 million. Um, there's also, by the way, this perverse incentive is also built into the ELL formula in the LCFF formula. And the cost here is unknown because we weren't able to, they weren't able to get the data. So um, there's a soft landing. That's a little bit of a wonky thing. Um, but uh, so, so one thing I want to really highlight is this is much like the Lafer report, uh, much like the NAACP's moratorium, what charter schools immediately go to is like, oh, they're just anti-charter school, right? This is not anti-charter school. UTLA actually represents almost 1,000 charter school educators. What, this, what are they afraid of? We're talking about numbers. You know who's afraid of numbers? People who's, for whom the numbers won't look good, right? That's all this is. It's simply a prudent fiscal analysis. And this is, and we went out of our way to say that, this is not the fault of the charter schools. This is the fault of statewide decision and district decisions that have meant that perverse incentives are baked into policy that mean that um, you can't blame somebody, well, you sort of can actually, but w when you bake a perverse incentive into policy, people are going to follow that perverse incentive. And so we need to clean up and we need to regulate this industry because so many things have been built into it that mean that our highest needs students are underserved, that means that um, every day, Public schools, public districts are having to make the choice of do we properly regulate charter schools or do we take money away from our public school students, right? And so let me bring it back to, um, to fiduciary duty, which I'm, I'm hoping that you all like feel half as passionate as I do about fiduciary duties because I'm really passionate about it. It's why I took four tests to get my CPA because I really, really believe in fiduciary duties, okay? What it is, is it basically means that you have a responsibility to your stakeholders. If you're a corporation, your stakeholder are your stockholders, right? If you're a public school district, if you're a government, your fiduciary duty is to your students and to your taxpayers, right? And so what does that mean? You have a duty of care. You have to inform yourself prior to making a decision of all material information. Right now, school districts are not allowed to do economic impact reports. They are being derelict in their duty of care. An economic impact report is a material information that you have to have available in order to understand what's happening with your students and with your taxpayers. You also have a duty of loyalty. One theme that you're hearing throughout this, uh, throughout this uh, session is the public, in public schools, public education as an institution. You have a duty of loyalty to public education as an institution. You have to refrain from doing injury. What we have seen with this economic impact report is that unmitigated, unregulated growth of charter schools is doing an injury to the public institution of public education. And that is a dereliction of fiduciary duties. You have a duty of prudence. You have to have care, skill, and caution when you are making decisions that affect your stakeholders. What sort of care, skill, and caution are you doing when you're not allowed to take into consideration fiscal and educational impacts when you're making decisions about charter schools? And finally, you have a duty of disclosure, right? You have to disclose to your stakeholders, to your parents, to your students, and your taxpayers, all facts and circumstances that are relevant to decision making. Right now, they are not allowed to do that. Public schools are not allowed to do that. CCSA wants to make sure that that continues, and we have to fight to make sure that fiduciary duties which is actually very exciting, um, that fiduciary duty is enforced and enshrined in policy and in the law. So thank you. My name is Tristan Brown with the California Federation of Teachers here to facilitate any questions and answers uh, at this time. Yes, ma'am. So, so let me just repeat the question for the camera. The question is, is it not legal for schools to do in, uh, for, school districts. for school districts to do these impact reports. It's not illegal to do the impact reports, but it is, not, it is illegal to utilize economic decisions in the authorization process. So what's the point of doing an impact report when you're explicitly forbidden from using this information, again, dereliction of duty of fiduciary duties, to make decisions that impact your students? All right, seeing and hearing none. Thank you so much for this Amazing information. Uh, you've sent me back to law school, at least, on fiduciary duties, and I wanted to jump on that because it's a great segue into a topic that I'll briefly cover, Assembly Bill 406, which is sponsored by the California Federation of Teachers. Uh, going along the fiduciary duty, 
I think some folks get lost sometimes in realizing that a school is an element of the public trust. It's an element of the state. It is there to serve the students, the taxpayers, as you just heard. A charter school is, again, supposed to be a public entity, and then they oftentimes will contract out their duties to a charter management organization. These organizations, when they operate in a for-profit arena, have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. If I invest in a company, I want one thing and one thing only, profit. I want my dividends to come back, uh, and I'm not entirely active in how you do that. So if it's by providing better music and arts classes or not, then I just care about the profit. So what AB 406 very simply does, it's an incredibly short bill. It says that a, a new petitioner or a charter that's coming back to renew their charter uh, may not be operated as or by a for-profit corporation or be operated by a for-profit charter management organization. Uh, we're there to ensure that these organizations that come in and dictate so much of a charter uh, are done with a nonprofit shield so that uh, the students come first, not profits. Uh, the education comes first, not dividends to shareholders. So that is the one clear and simple message for Assembly Bill 406. The worst kept secret in the United States is that we've created a system in which the children of the wealthy receive the best educational opportunities. This inequality is historical. It's readily apparent in every city. This means that the poor experience inequality such as lesser education facilities, technology, nutritional opportunities, more police in their school, less counselors, less experienced, and more new teachers. And this has been on purpose. It hasn't been a mistake. And it's the shame of our nation. Considering the research and data is important to introduce evidence into our national and democratic conversation about privately managed school choice. Note, I'm not going to say school choice. I'm going to talk about privately managed school choice because that's the common sloganeering that's not heard from pro proponents. I think it's unfortunate that some people in the school choice conversation, they can't be reached with evidence or reason. But I believe that the growing crescendo in the public discourse about school choice is due to the growing body of research and personal experiences entering our national conversation. We provided evidence today and counter-narrative about privately managed school choice. As we do this, Americans are understanding the problems. But the well-heeled well conservative philanthropists, such as the Koch brothers, Alec, Walton Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, and the Foundation for Educational Excellence, are continue to intensely lobby for charter schools. But why, are they, why is this the choice pressed by business interests in the public discourse? There are, of course, other forms of school choice, such as in-district charters, community schools, magnets, magnets and inter-district choice. The reason is because charters are consistent with the political agenda to monopolize and privately control public dollars. Now is a watershed moment for privately managed school choice. In fact, Donald Trump has proposed spending $20 billion on charter schools and also vouchers. In his most recent skinny budget, he proposed cutting school programs, federal grants for college, federal work study, um, even Meals on Wheels, so that he could spend a billion dollars on privately managed school choice. So it's becoming more clear by the day that Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos love privately managed school choice. So what will California do? Will we execute the Trump and DeVos privatization agenda? Or will our state make investments in community-based school choice options such as magnets and community schools? Californians must also ensure that transparency and accountability legislation that we've spoken about today reigns in the litany of abuses documented in privately managed school choice business. And I put business after school choice there on purpose. We must also find ways to give charter parents and teachers voice who have experienced discrimination and abuses. We are doing a terrible job at that. We must reinsert democracy into our education reform efforts. I believe that Californians in this hearing have made the case by showing important data and personal experiences that demonstrate unbridled, unaccountable, non-democratic approaches, approaches to school choice are not the answer for challenges for California's students. So thank you for coming, 
And also please consider the Network for Public Education's fourth annual conference in Oakland, California, October 14 and 15. You can register early now on our website. Thank you.